Last time, we began looking at the so-called non-delegation doctrine. According to the non-delegation doctrine, the Constitution not only vests all legislative power in Congress, it keeps it there. Congress has no power to delegate its legislative power, not even a little of it, not even if Congress thinks it is necessary and proper to do so. The opinions in cases in which it appears that Congress has delegated legislative power all seem to have two features. One, they authorize what the executive official did, and two, they deny that what the official did was an exercise of legislative power. They call it something else. Call it proclaiming a fact having legal effect. Or call it filling up minor gaps. Or declare, as the court did in the Hampton case, that it doesn't matter precisely what you call what the official did, so long as the doing was within the scope of an intelligible principle that Congress put in the statute to guide the official's use of discretion. Just don't call it legislating, whatever you do. Only Congress itself can exercise the legislative power. Hayek was troubled by this kind of legislative practice. It is too easy for legislators to kick the can down the road by passing the buck to the bureaucracy. Excuse the mixed metaphors. Parliaments come to be regarded as ineffective talking shops, unable or incompetent to carry out the tasks for which they have been chosen. The conviction grows that if efficient planning is to be done, the direction must be taken out of politics and placed in the hands of experts, permanent officials or independent autonomous bodies. Hayek cautioned that this can start us down what he called the road to serfdom. Liberty slips away or is slowly cooked like the proverbial frog in the kettle. Sorry about the metaphors. The non-delegation doctrine would not seem to be worth dwelling on were it not for a pair of cases decided in the midst of the Great Depression, Schechter Poultry and Panama Refining. The opinion in Schechter Poultry ought to tell us where the outer limit of Congress's power to delegate authority to the president and the executive agencies might lie. At issue in Schechter was the constitutionality of key provisions of the National Industrial Recovery Act. The purpose of the act was to stimulate the economy, which was caught in a so-called deflationary spiral. Prices were too low for it to be worth producing and hiring. The unemployment rate was around 25%. To address the problem, Congress might have drawn up codes of fair competition for each industry in the economy, which might have the anticipated and hoped for effect of stabilizing prices and stimulating production and hiring. Certainly, Congress was persuaded that this was the way to go. But the informational burden of drawing up such codes was enormous. Even if a trade association fairly representing each segment of the economy were to submit proposals, Congress believed that it was not equal to the task of legislating, considering, and approving each proposal. We might say, well, isn't that how lobbying works normally? But this was not a time of business as usual. What was called for was something other than special favors that benefited all members of an industry equally. In Schechter itself, for example, one private poultry company was complaining that it had to follow rules that it did not think it benefited from. Congress believed quick and decisive action to settle such squabbles was essential to ending the Depression. That is why the NIRA directed the president to consider proposed codes offered by trade groups and decide 
a whether the group was fairly constituted and b whether the code would promote economic pro recovery that is raise prices now if this task sounds similar to you to that of setting tariff rates that are reciprocally equal and equalize the cost of production I agree this is what the statute says in relevant part upon the application to the president by one or more trade or industrial associations the president may approve a code of fair competition if the president find that, finds that such codes will tend to effectuate the policy of this title. After the president shall approve any such code, the provisions shall be the standards of fair competition for trade for that trade or industry. Any violation of such standards shall be deemed an unfair method of competition and commerce within the meaning of the Federal Trade Commission Act. The key idea is fair competition. The opinion of the court acknowledges precedents upholding statutes that contain an intelligible principle of comparable breadth. But the court seems to find a problem with the concept of fair competition in the National Industrial Recovery Act. What does fair competition mean? as the term is used in this act. The opinion in Schechter expresses the suspicion that the NIRA is, in effect, a wholesale transfer of the legislative power to the president, contrary to Article I, and the principle of separation of powers implicit in the constitutional structure. Notice that the NIRA builds upon a prior statute the FTC Act. Section 5 prescribes unfair methods of competition in or affecting commerce and unfair or deceptive acts and practices. The concept of fair is clear enough here. The court had already upheld the constitutionality of the FTC Act. How did the NIR Act fail to state an intelligible principle? It simply gave the president the power to make a determination of a kind that it had already authorized the Federal Trade Commission to make. It was unclear at this time whether the FTC had rulemaking power, but the FTC clearly had power to order Schechter Poultry to cease and desist the unfair practice of selling individual chickens while all other poultry companies sold only by the crate. Section 5B empowers the FTC to require any party to show cause why an order should not be entered by the Commission requiring it to cease and desist. After the NIRA was passed, all that changed was that the FTC could take a violation of a presidentially approved code of fair competition as conclusive evidence of an unfair trade practice. Why did the court react as it did? The answer to this question is not to be found by scrutinizing the text of Article I. We need to bear in mind that the court was worried about a global trend toward authoritarian government, toward dictatorship. Dictatorship is essentially a suspension of the distinction between legislative and executive. Thus wrote the German political theorist Karl Schmitt in his book The Crisis of Parliamentary Democracy, published in 1923. Schmidt wasn't cited in Schechter Poultry, of course. He wasn't needed, even if he had even been read by the justices. Schmidt sounds very much like James Madison here. Simply substitute dictatorship for tyranny. The Schechter court likely took the NIRA as effectively suspending the distinction between the legislative and the executive branches. Schmidt favored dictatorship over representative democracy. Uh, 
when dire events like the Great Depression justify declaring a state of exception. Here we see German President Hindenburg offering the chancellorship to Adolf Hitler in 1933. In very short order, the Reichstag authorized Hitler to rule by decree. Some of the justices of the U.S. Supreme Court may have acted on a hunch that the NIRA would snowball in a similar way. Soon after the decisions in Schechter Poultry and Panama Refining were handed down, President Roosevelt proposed legislation that would effectively increase the size of the Supreme Court. Under the plan, a new justice would be appointed for each sitting justice over the age of 70. The motive was, nominally, to give the old geezers some help. No one was fooled, and the proposal was ridiculed as FDR's court-packing plan. The number of seats on the Supreme Court is not specified in Article III, which defines the federal judicial branch. Nonetheless, the court-packing plan was widely believed to be contrary to the principle of separation of powers. Even though constitutional judicial review is, in essence, counter-majoritarian, it is commonly said that efforts to discourage judicial review are themselves anti-democratic. The court quickly altered course, largely thanks to Swing Justice Roberts, the first Justice Roberts, suddenly taking a friendlier attitude toward New Deal legislation. The court packing plan failed by a wide margin in the Senate, but FDR had made his point. Over the next decade, a number of statutes were upheld against non-delegation doctrine challenges. In NBC versus United States in 1943, the court upheld the FCC's power to issue such rules as public convenience, interest, or necessity requires. In Yakis v. United States in 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the power of the Office of Price Administration to set generally fair and equitable prices. And in American Power and Light v. SEC, decided in 1946, the court upheld the SEC's power to ensure that corporate structures do not unfairly or inequitably distribute voting power in corporate reorganizations. For decades, the non-delegation doctrine was believed to be a dead letter. As we shall see next time, this obituary could have been premature. 